Jesus Christ so Jesus of the Word of God. We're here as far as Bible study to look at the scriptures and study them together to try to understand the meaning of uh, the scriptures. And we are here uh, tonight to use the main textbook. And that main textbook is the Bible. So trust that everybody have a Bible. We share with you that we're going to talk about and remind ourselves about theology. Okay, this is not a new subject. If you've been here for a while, or really if you've been here a year or more, you have heard the subject and you have heard teaching that centers around uh, the subject of a theology. Not only have you heard teaching that centered around the subject of theology, but you have also heard the theological teaching and theological preaching. There's a question that is lingering out there today, and that question is, what is the state of theology among believers? What is the state of theology? And that question is asked. It is a thought-provoking question. It is a question that demands an answer, and uh, the question is a probing question that is one taking a survey of the body of Christ, not just a local assembly, but across the region of the body of Christ, and is causing them to ask specific questions that centers around the Bible and get a response from those who are professing to be believers of what they think about the question and or how would they respond to the question from a biblical perspective. And I think that is good because the Bible teaches us as believers that we should evaluate ourselves, uh, see whether we be in the faith, and we also should study to do what? Show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So when it comes to theology, when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to the word of God, uh, every church should be striving as God blesses them to become well-rounded in understanding the Bible. Even though there may, you know, each church or each local assembly may have their own kind of identity or personality, and there may be some that kind of, um, if you would allow me to say it this way, they may specialize more so in certain subjects and that they may be more drawn to, but at the same time, it is a local assembly's job, as well as the body of Christ, to become well-rounded in the scriptures. So, in other words, it's not just the subject of faith, but faith is a part. It's not just the subject of praise and worship, but praise and worship is a part. It is not just the subject of prayer. And each of us in here today, we may have our personal preference or that particular Bible doctrine or subject that we are drawn to. Um, but all of us together, we're to come together to help assist the whole assembly and the entire body of Christ. So, therefore, it is the church's job to learn the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Even though God has delivered unto us as been a part of the New Testament church to preach the mysteries of Christ, uh, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are also to study, as I stated in times past, the Old Testament. Uh, and studying the Old Testament helps one to appreciate the New Testament. And not only appreciate it, but to even understand the New Testament. We can never fully understand the New Testament until we learn some things about the Old Testament. Because when the New Testament says things like, and he offered up his blood, he did what? He offered up his blood, what did he do? Did he take a collection plate and pass it around in the church and collected blood, and then what did he do? If we study the Old Testament, we'll be more apt and ready to get some type of understanding of what that means. You cannot appreciate redemption in the New Testament until, we talked about this through our study in Romans, 
until we learn something about the sacrifices of the Old Testament and the purpose of those sacrifices. So here at Power, Hope, and Grace, we have, uh, as I stated before, we have Sunday school and or Christian education. And we deal with subjects throughout the entire Bible. That's why it is interesting to me when people start asking, well, are you going to deal with such and such subject, such and such and such? I readily know that they probably don't come to Sunday school. And I'm not trying to be funny. I'm very serious. They don't come because in Sunday school we deal with all of those subjects. Because in five years, every five years, we're basically going through the capsule of the entire Bible. Every five years. We still welcome your questions. Keep on asking them because we're going to pour them in you. We want them to be imprinted upon your heart. But between Sunday school, Sunday worship, and Bible class, every one of us should be able, if you're a member of Power, Hope, and Grace, should be able to go to any Bible institution and at least get a Bible certificate. I said that before. Now, I've done my part. I'm, I'm, I'm going to continue to do my part. See, the teacher can teach it, but what has to happen? We have to receive it. We have to take it in. So I should be able to uh, present Frankie's Bible certificate. It was easy to pick on him because he just walked in. Well, working, working man. <laughs> All right. And there's one thing about Frankie. Frankie ain't no lazy guy. I appreciate that. All right. So uh, um, uh, uh, I should be able to sign his certificate and show his certificate off. Say, uh, members of Powell and Grace Bible Church, we are happy to bestow upon Frankie Sharp a certificate in Bible study. So I should be able, my, I should be getting hand cramps by signing and checking off on all of you all. So that is our goal. That is our objective, to teach you the Bible. Amen. Look at how they're looking at me, Holy Ghost. But we're going to work it. Amen. So are y'all ready for this test here tonight? Come on. Come on. Johnny right out said, no, no, Johnny, that's the second time you said that. When are you going to be ready? Uh-huh. I caught you. You didn't think I was coming back like that. Huh? <laughs> okay. No, no test tonight. No test tonight. No, y'all was a little concerned. I looked over at Doug. Yeah. <laughs> And y'all know how I know he was a little concerned. <laughs> now I have to remember I'm on tape, so I have to adjust some things, you all, okay? I'm on tape now. And uh, so uh, to our television audience, uh, welcome to Power, Hope, and Grace Bible Church. And thank God for editing, too. <laughs> okay, um, theology, remember we shared with you that it presupposes God. It presupposes the existence of God. The reason theology presupposes the existence of God is because theology in and of itself deals with the study of God. Okay? Now, um, along with that, theology is used many times as a broad heading that not only just deal with the doctrine of God and or the existence of God. But if you add another word to it or before it, and that is the word systematic. So systematic theology deals with various subjects uh, throughout the Bible that tries to give one an understanding really of the complete Bible broken down in various subjects and themes and that is studied in a systematic way. Many times, and probably in most cases, the study deals with what one feels is the greater to the lesser. And what we simply mean by that, the greater or the, what is uh, 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 meant or felt to be the most important subjects down to the lesser subjects, which doesn't take away from the importance of the subjects in and of themselves. But in other words, here is the main things that we need to understand first before we can truly get this, whatever that may be. So, 
who is the greatest one that we can start with? God. Now, in systematic theology, you'll find in most systematic theological studies and teaching that it starts with God, the Father. Doesn't start right out with the triunity of God, but the triunity of God follow very close. But it generally starts out with God the Father. And if it doesn't start out with God the Father, then chances are it will start out with the Bible, the Word of God, as the inerrant Word. Okay? Because it is through the Scriptures that reveals to us who God is. All right, you all got that? Yes, so we see there's more to the Bible than a Hakamashanda, right? A Mahanda, a Yama, Yama, Yama. Okay, this is theology, and the church needs to understand this. Amen. As I've shared in times past, it, was, it is never our intent to attempt to talk above anyone. It is our intent to try to break it down so we can really understand it and receive it. But at the same time, it is vitally important for the student themselves to embrace what is taught and remember that it is the teacher's job not necessarily to tell you every single thing. It is a teacher's job to present the foundation and for each person to build upon that foundation by one, taking what they heard the teacher teach to see if the teacher taught it according to the scriptures. Number two, if they have been taught according to the scripture, they take what they have been taught and they build upon it. Naturally speaking, what is the most important thing when a house is getting ready to be built? Foundation. The foundation. And we know that, right? If the foundation is not uh, dug out and poured, then that house can be built upon dirt or sand. So, oh, and you can look in and you say, oh, this house is beautiful. This house is the bomb. This house is, oh, look at those walls. They're plastered. They are painted. Look at the curtains. Look at the octagon, jet, jacuzzi, tub. Oh, look at the kitchen with all of the marble counters and uh, the microwave and the stainless steel refrigerator. You let a good rain come. There's a good chance that that house, in all of its splendor, can literally and physically be carried away or fall over or some wall just lean through the mud and the moisture and the water. But if it is built on a foundation, a foundation gives it stability. In the foundation, there are also anchors put in that foundation. What is the purpose of an anchor? To hold that house that is set on the foundation down. The anchor is tied into that wood, tied into them joists, tied into that top plate to hold, help hold that house down. Then the weight of the house itself assists in supporting what the anchor is doing through the concrete. So it becomes very important, since I've just told you how to build a house, for us to make sure that our spiritual lives are built accordingly. Now, no one can build a good, sound, spiritual life outside of the Word of God. No one can build a solid life listening to Dr. Phil all day. No one can build a good spiritual life listening to my man, Steve Harvey. No one can build it by listening to Oprah or who else do you all listen to? Watching Dynasty, you know, Dynasty came back one time, Dallas came back. Can watch, and no, can you build a good spirit like watching The Voice? Rerun after rerun after rerun. You catch it the first go round, but rerun after rerun. We have to study the Word of God, the Bible. So when Pastor comes up and says we're going to study theology, the truth be told, if we truly understand what theology is all about, people should perk up instead of saying, oh, gosh, he's getting ready to go to one of them long series again about theology. 
Okay, I'll wait. Y'all tell me, call me when he talks about prosperity. I'll show up then. No, because all the prosperity in the world means nothing without God. So, we talk about theology and we deal with the study of uh, <coughs> God. <coughs> You may remember, we talked about this before, we're dealing with what is called theology proper. <clears throat> Everybody say theology proper. Theology. Now these are good questions that's going to be on the test. And y'all know Sister Belinda, when she asks questions, so I'm saying that she's going to help me put these questions together, remind me of these questions, so when I put them on the test, you know, for me to write them on the test and ask you all. So theology proper. Theology the study of <laughs> theology, the study of God. <laughs> okay, theology proper deals more specifically with, not, uh, not at this point dealing with all the other doctrines and things, it deals with God. And even more specifically, Sister Angie, when we started out with theology proper, we are more directly at this point talking about God the Father. <clears throat> We're not talking about the Son yet. We're talking about God the Father, okay? Because uh, in theology proper, it has to start with the foundation. We would know nothing about the Son of God until we learn something about God the Father. Okay? Now, subsequently, there are many other doctrines that we will be exposed to, and we'll talk about some of those, uh, hit on some of them tonight, and we would uh, build a list as we continue in our uh, studies. So, what do we know when, when you hear someone say, God the Father, what, what comes to mind? Just right off, say that again? All right, okay. So, he is a creator. You cannot talk about the creator without talking about creation, all right? What else comes to mind? All right, somebody said spirit. All right. Man, I knew I had some theologians in this class. Yes, Johnny. Hearing or healing? Healer. Man, shut up. <laughs> All right, healer. Yeah, if you don't understand what I just said, Auntie, explain that in the car. Okay? Anybody else? We think of God, the Father. Yes, ma'am. All right, supreme. That's good. All powerful. That's good. Deliverer. That's good. Omnipresent. Omniscience. All of these omnis. What, the, what does omni mean? Oh, all right. So these are things that come to mind when we think about God the Father. There could be various other things that come to mind as well. So... <clears throat> Depending upon which approach one wants to take when it comes to systematic theology, they'll start either with God, the Father, and or the Bible. Generally, it flows like this. If they start with the Bible as the inerrant word of God, they'll talk about God, the Father. Then perhaps they'll talk about Jesus Christ. Then after that, the Holy Spirit, who he is and what he does. Then after that, it could flow a number of ways, all right, because um, now you can get into the doctrine, which simply means the teaching of creation. Then you can get in the, eventually to what is called angels or angelology. You can get into talking about Lucifer, Satan, the devil, demonology. Get into talking about God being other attributes of God, a, a covenant-keeping God, and things of that nature. So everything that I'm sharing with you, it really should not in any way be really new to your mind. It should just be a reminder. And one of the reasons why it's important for us as well to teach through these things is because we are trying to prepare ourselves to go back out into the streets on our jobs, in our neighborhood, to our families, and to be able to better present Christ to them. 
And it is not that we are going in our witnessing when we go out to witness to make a person that we're witnessing to a theologian. We're trying to present Christ to them. But what helps the believer present Christ is when the believer know for themselves who God is and who Jesus is. Many times there is a hesitation when people feel, and you know, you know this yourself, that either if you haven't said it, you may know someone who did. Yeah, I, I would go out and would, but I don't know what to say, or I, I, I just don't know enough, and 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 and, and I don't want to present the wrong message. May I remind you here at PhD, if you have gone through the Bible survey course, Old Testament and New Testament, if you have gone through the uh, essentials of the uh, doctrine if you have gone through how to study the Bible, if you have gone through pretty much any of our Christian education material, whether you realize or not, you may be more equipped than what you think. But I just don't know. I just don't know. Well, I'm going to tell you how you can know. Just go out there and start witnessing. Don't let there be no shame in your game. You'll know how much you know, and if you don't know, guess what? We here. Come on back. Ask questions. Let's talk. Are you all hearing me? Yes, sir. You, we have to ask questions. We have to talk. But you must put it into practice. Now, something that's very important, and I shared this before, and I shared uh, again. Uh, as a matter of fact, we want to get information out to all of those that are part of our um, uh, canvassing. You know, instead of calling special classes, we're going to teach this in Bible class. So you and Elder Charlie, y'all get ready to present too. That way... We won't have all these different. Everybody come to Bible class and let, all, let us all get it at one time. We don't have to have any other special classes. So I know they already sent you some information, but we can resend. That's why when they send stuff, it says you want to resend back, so we'll resend. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and by the way, everybody is called to witness. There may be others who have such a passion and a desire and may be, as we use the term, more gifted in certain areas. But it's every believer's job to witness Christ to somebody. Amen. So whether you join the team that physically walks out or not, you're supposed to witness somewhere. All right? So just keep that uh, in mind. So the Bible presupposes what? God. Do you not know the Bible never really takes much time to defend God? I'd be more than happy to. The Bible doesn't spend a lot of time in defending God. You know how we'll do sometimes. Well, no, I didn't say it. I know people, they just be lying on me. And if you really knew me, you know that ain't me. That's how I'm like. And I would never do that. Hey, okay, well, I got to, because I got to call so and so. I got to explain to them. You know, Sister Valette, I really didn't do it, honest to God. I know seven people told you I did. But you know I'm not that kind of person. Sister Valette, how long have you known me? All right, I get through it. Hey, well, Brother Osborne, Brother Osborne, you know, I just got to talking to uh, Frankie. I just got to talking to him. And I just had to call you. And before it's over with, man, I'm wore out and still can't sleep. Wore out and still can't go to sleep because I'm worried. God doesn't do that. God says things such as, I am. That I am. I'm God. Beside me, there's none other. Bye. And God moving on. So the Bible presupposes God. Now, with that said, the Bible goes into some pretty clear and specific detail in sharing with us who God is. And this is why the Bible starts out. Let us turn there. You know it. A powerful verse. And on the test, I'm going to ask you to quote that verse verbatim by memory without having to turn to it. Genesis 1 and 1. And since you don't know it, we're going to learn it tonight, right? <laughs> Genesis 1 and 1. Let's turn there. <clears throat> All right, what does that say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Read. The earth was without form and it was a void. Now let us just stop there for a moment. Look at how the Bible starts out. 
The Bible doesn't sit down and go into this long, drawn-out introduction about God. Well, you see, eons ago, um, you know, 2.5 billion years ago, uh, God came on the scene. And, uh, and how God came on the scene was explanation A, then exhibit 1A. It doesn't. It simply says, in the beginning, God. So what do we have? The presupposition. Yes, sir. That is turned into an emphatic statement. And the only way it could, uh, well, in the sense of language, that it could turn into an emphatic statement because of the presuppositions. The presupposition is God had existed. When did God exist? No, 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 no. Just like my, I call y'all theologians, but my early class did the same thing. Well, it is true that he existed in the beginning, but his existence is before the beginning in order for there to be a beginning. So the Bible starts with God. And how many of us know in the believer's life, everything we do is to be starting with and centered around God? Not me, myself, and I. Not me, myself, and Irene. Not, you know, me, myself, and Jim, and Buck, and them. But God. Jesus said, seek uno, number one, the kingdom of God. He didn't say seek the kingdom of man. He didn't say seek the kingdom of said king Said queen or said prayer, seek first the kingdom of God. Theology starts with God. And I can tell you this much now, not only starts with God, but it never ends. I know y'all was waiting for me to say it, but it ends with God. No, it never ends. It's still all God. All God. You know why? Because theology proper teaches us that God is Eternal. Eternal in the English language many times is assumed and looked at as eternal future. It includes that when it comes to God, but it is not limited to that because God lives in eternity past. The human mind sometimes want to readily say, if God lives in eternity past, well, when did he start? No, you missed it. The word eternity has no beginning to it. I've asked this question many times throughout ministry, uh, other places, and preaching revivals and, and, and crusades and, and, and whatever we were doing at the time. I always trying to help people to remember the existence of, as well as some of the attributes of the one that we say we serve. The only being that is eternal, as far as from eternity past, eternity future. You and I will one day, as believers, be able to share in that eternity, but we are not from eternity past. We had a beginning, everything about us, our body, our soul, and spirit. Now, unfortunately, there were some that would try to say different. There's some that would try to say your spirit existed forever, that your spirit is from eternity to eternity. But there's no biblical support for that at all. And one of the places we can go to is Genesis. Adam was made, and then God did what? Breathed. And to him the breath of life, and he what? Be king. He was not before, but he became after God created and formed him. So you and I have a beginning. All right, now, um, with that said, let us um, look here at, uh, well, I tell you what, go over to Hebrews chapter 11. I'm 
I'm going to move around and give you a few other scriptures here. Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. It tells, reminds us something about God. Once again, you know these scriptures, but let us be reminded of the power of these scriptures. Hebrews 11 and 6 says what? Without faith, possible to please God. All right. For he who what? Comes to God, must believe that God came into being, must believe that God was born, must believe that God evolved, must believe that God was created. I haven't gotten it right yet. Why y'all keep, you know, acting like I got this wrong? Come on, you want to step out in the hall? <laughs> um, must believe that he is. Now, how many times have you read that scripture? How many times have we heard that priest? And for the moment, one can get excited. Preach it, preach it, tell it. No, God is. So did God stop being God is once the message was over? Did he stop? So the truth of the matter is that God who is or was is when the Hebrew writer wrote this is still who he was when he was is. He is is right now. I'm trying to make it plain. Y'all talk to me. God cannot stop being God. Now, does do is it? Or do believers' life reflect that? Reflect the fact that God still is? Now, that's not a question to ask out loud. So those who believe that he is, noted, it says that they must believe. That is a direct command that places a demand upon the person who is a recipient of this scripture. You must believe. That he is. Not that he becomes, but that he is. And in conjunction with that, that he is what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Now, there can be no diligently seeking God without teaching about God and searching the scriptures about God. So if a person feels like, well, you know, I know about God. I mean, you ain't got to tell me and God, we like this. And what disproves that them and God ain't really like this, the first test that comes. I don't know. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can make it. I just can't do this no more. I done did this for five years. And then somebody was telling me and said, and God ain't did what he said he was going to do yet. You can never make that statement because everything that God said he was going to do in his divine will really is done. We got to play our role out and stay under the realm of blessing. Don't step out the realm of blessing and then say, well, God didn't bless me. Yeah, the blessing probably came, but where were you? The blessing came to overtake you, but you way over here. But the blessing still operated in God's will. But God is so good every now and then. God will reach way over here and know you out of his will and still get you a little blessing. Can I get a witness in here today? You know you didn't do right. You know you didn't act right. You know you wasn't even praying right. And God still showed a little love. Gave you that job, opened up that door, made a way, caused the bill to be paid, healed your body. You didn't have to do all that. You over here fussing, arguing, and complaining. And blaming God, everybody else blessed but me. And guess, and guess what we're talking about? We're talking about God. Amen. Ooh, Lord have mercy. That wasn't in my notes, but that was good for all of us. <laughs> good for me, too. You know, so boom, 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 come right back. That's good. I receive it, Lord. That's your word that God is. So to diligently seek him once again denotes that there has to be a willingness there has to be persistence. There has to be an effort that is put forth. Do not just assume. Thing. Put the effort forth. <laughs> Seek the Lord while he may be found, the prophet tells us in Isaiah. Call upon him while he is near. And while you're doing that, forsake your sinful ways. Work of iniquity and go after God. 
You go after God, the Lord said, guess what? You'll find me. I won't have myself forever, nor will I be angry forever. Now, don't get it twisted. We can make God angry right now, today. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. But God said, you're my child. I'll chasten you. I'll get after you, but I won't be angry with you forever. All right. Um, so go to uh, St. John chapter 17. St. John chapter 17. St. John chapter 17, look at verse number 3. <clears throat> All right. St. John 17, verse 3, in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, And this is, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. What? Mm hmm. Whom you have sent. Verse 4. Glorify you on earth. I have finished the work that you have given me to do. Now And now, O oh Father, glorify me. All right, we're going to stop there. One moment. Glorify me together with yourself. So what do we have? The Son of God that talks about and refers to the true and living God. Now look at what the Son does. The Son establishes an order. The Son gives the glory to the Father. So theology proper, you don't just, you know, necessarily, I mean, you, you teach Jesus, you talk about Jesus, but don't just jump to Jesus. Deal with God, and when you deal with God, the mystery will unfold of how powerful and how wonderful and how awesome it is when we read a scripture like St. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten son. You see how we can quote that scripture and it's just a popular scripture. You know, everybody knows. You hear quoted Christmas, you hear quoted uh, Easter, you hear quoted, you know, about preachers who start now, because that's about all they know in the beginning, you know, or for God so loved the world. You know, every preacher starting now preach St. John 3.16. And some of them in their first year may preach everywhere they get an invitation now, let her turn on by them. It's a very familiar passage of scripture. St. John 3, 16. And what is amazing, as many times as it's preached, do we really understand the significance? That verse, by many, is called the golden text of the Bible. And I think that there is a place where that description is befitting. The golden text. Everything else now centers around what God did and is doing for us through his son, that whoever believes in the son should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. So what does that mean? They will share everlasting life with the God who exists forever. Now, you know, I told you I'm from a Pentecostal apostolic background. And we came up, we were used to folk talking to the preacher. Now there's some very conservative churches whose people sit there and just, you know, listen, and, you know, they're learning. But I've heard some noted conservative preachers say they wish their congregation was like, I was going to say what we are, but how we used to be. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't care what y'all went through today and how rough today was. We're talking Bible. Yeah. God so loved the world. Preach, now, now, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Don't get me started. I'll start walking the floor. <laughs> no. And I'm not saying it takes all of that. I'm just, you know, expressing the point that we got to get this. Yes, when somebody says, but God, I perk up because now I want to know what you're talking about because there are so-called religions outside of uh, uh, dealing with theology proper and properly come up with other methods of how God is, what God supposedly is doing to save the world. And to save mankind, they're trying to make other ways, invent other ways to God. There can be no other way. It is absolutely impossible. And this is why I oftentimes say it, not to be redundant per se, or not for it to get old, that Christianity is the only religion on the face of the entire 
earth. That's right. Amen. Now, because theology and the state of it in the church today, there are many evangelicals who would try to argue that point. And the percentage, uh, if my memory serves me correct, I had a document that had it on, on there, but I don't have it with me. It is close to 30 to 40 percent of people who are supposed to be evangelical believers. When we use that term evangelical, what we're dealing with is really the Protestant church. Anyone that comes under that umbrella that suppose, that confesses that they believe in the main essential doctrines of the Christian faith. So in that sense, we would be considered as evangelicals. Well, I am considered as an evangelical. <laughs> that Christianity is the only thing that's right. So among theology proper, it'll teach us, we'll come across subjects such as abortion, so-called same-sex marriage, so-called you know, marriage and remarriage and divorce. We'll come across a number of things that when people are trying to be, by today's standard, of what is considered politically correct, if they do not understand theology proper, they will cave in, give in, yield, and submit to what is called political correctness. Theology proper teaches us it is never, ever, ever, never about political correctness. It's about honoring the one that theology is teaching us about. And he whom theology is teaching us about is God who has his word, capital W-O-R-D. So when I ask you on the test, when it comes to the Bible, how should the word be spelled? Anybody that puts a small case W, you're going to get it wrong. <laughs> it's capital W. Because it is identifying something that is supreme, something that overrules the government, Congress, federal government, international laws. It doesn't matter. God stands alone. And the church is being tried. Among evangelicals, the question was asked, what do you think? Do you think that uh, same-sex marriage is wrong, and I always say so-called because it's not marriage Absolutely. by any measure of the term. <clears throat> See, y'all that want theology proper, y'all need, need, need to catch that or say amen or something. It is not marriage. There is only one marriage, one thing that can ever be marriage. Anything else outside of that, it is absolutely impossible for it to be Marriage, just like there's really no such thing as transgender. There's no such thing. That's man-made stuff. And the Bible says, when it comes to man, it changes God's order. Let God be true and every man a liar. That's what theology proper teaches me. So the question is asked among evangelical, what do you say about abortion? You'll be shocked. I'm bring the statistics in of what some are saying about abortion. You're shocked at what some are saying about same sex, so called marriage. So it gets back to what we started out with. What is the state of theology? Now, if we were to call a revival and just have a person come in and simply preach the gospel and deal with systematic theology, how many Christians would show up for three days? Would show up for five days? No hype. Not, matter of fact, choir, y'all got a break all week. We come in, sing one or two congregational songs led by Brother Lorenzo down at the cross, you know. He, he know them songs. Y'all laugh. Lorenzo can hold a note now. He can, he can, he can. His wife said, yeah, that's about it. He can hold a note. Right? <laughs> she ain't going to give him the mic for the soul, but he can hold a note. And we come in and say, we're going to just let the preacher preach, uh, teach for about 60 minutes or even hour, 15 minutes, just on systematic theology. 
What, what, what would the state of the church be? Now, if I turn around and say that we're going to bring in uh, Prophet Brian Kern, if I do that, fire me immediately. Or we say we're going to bring in Bishop Noel Jones. Now, people are going to come out the woodworks. They're going to come out the woodworks. Now, I hate to believe that people of power, hope, and grace would do that, but people of power, hope, and grace would do that. Yeah, they're going to come out of the woodworks. Oh, no, Jones going to be. I got to get there early. Miles will be on the front seat. <laughs> no, I did. He might you know I can mess with him. Yeah, my, you understand what I'm saying? But to simply deal with really what's important. And I'm not saying that Noel Jones can't preach a good message. Don't get me wrong. I'm just using an illustration. Because, you know, like I say, here they go out. Here they go Bishop Wingate throwing somebody else under the bus. I haven't thrown anybody under the bus. If anybody under the bus, that's because they slipped themselves. <laughs> and I just confirmed it. That's all. I didn't throw anybody. I would never do that. So um, because of the state of theology. If theology is preached on some Sunday mornings, there are people in the pews that will leave out and say, well, the preacher really didn't preach today. They just talked. But yet they dealt with Scripture. They dealt with the Bible. They dealt with God. So you all understand that comes out that there's nothing more important than that. Now, as I said before, we're going to help preach you out of the valley. Oh, yeah, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take you through it, but we ain't going to leave you in it. Because goodness and mercy is following. Goodness and mercy is taking us somewhere. Yes, sir. Boy, y'all like that, don't you? <laughs> goodness and mercy is taking me somewhere. I'm coming out the valley. Yes, you're coming out. But guess what? Guess who allowed you to go through the valley? Who allowed it? God allowed it. Guess who's going to be there with you? God. What? God. He prepares what? A table before me where in the presence of my And he anoints my head. But where am I at? In the presence of my enemy? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's theology proper who God is, what God does, how God is there all the time. So maybe we ought to try it, hold a revival on theology, and take a, you know, we won't take attendance. You know, we got all of these gadgets now, cameras just scroll. You ever been on TV and didn't know it? You look, say, man, that look like me. And you look, wait a minute, that is me. Oh, my goodness. I wish I would have did my hair another way. I should have put on a little more makeup. I should have choked my tie up. Smile. You're on camera. Amen. So Jesus says, eternal life. They can know it, but only through the only true God. Go to Romans chapter 1. And this is just so befitting because we're not too long ago went over this, but just to emphasize the point, Romans 1, 18. The Bible presupposes God. Romans 1, 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, ungodliness, sorry, and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. Right? Because of God is what? Manifested in them for God when for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are so everything starts with God and in one sense of the term, ends with God, and in between is all about God. Amen. And if anyone denies that, the Bible calls them either a fool or foolish. 
And it's not good to be called a fool or to be foolish. <clears throat> so no one has a right, really, to call a meeting and say the agenda today is about whether God exists or not. No one really has a right to call a meeting and say, well, today we are going to vote on whether the Bible is right or not. God said it's right, so who are you? If God says it's right, everybody has to bow down to it. We'll close out here, and I'll take any questions if there be any. Uh, Psalms, go to Psalms 14. I know some of y'all have closed your Bibles already, but let's, let's get this one. Uh, let's see. Yes, that's it. Psalms uh, 14, verse 1 and 2. Well, 1 through 3. All right, let's read. It says, What the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who see God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. So who's going to operate in working that which isn't good? Someone who is acting very foolish. So, according to some statistics that we'll talk about, dealing once again with things like abortion, so-called same-sex marriage, uh, the question that centers around, are there more than one way to God? Are there other religions and their writings, are they inspired like the Bible? These are questions that have been asked to evangelicals. Uh, questions such as, uh, do you believe that heaven is real? Do you believe that hell is real? Do you believe that hell is eternal? I told you in recent times, that is a hot debate among some Christians. You know, some will say, well, there's a hell, but uh, it's not forever. You know, you have some that says, I guess can't see a loving God condemning somebody forever. Now, I, I'm not going to go as far as to say that someone who believes that uh, is not a Christian, uh, but for me, that is problematic um, because at least they do believe in a hell. They just don't believe in the uh, eternalness of it, okay? So uh, that's open for discussion. But if somebody asks you that, what is your response? How will you answer that? These are things that we learn in Sunday school. These are things we learn in Bible class. Someone asked about abortion. How do you respond to that? How do you respond if someone says if the mother's life is in jeopardy? And an abortion, uh, the baby has to be taken. What do you do? These are real questions, people. And, then, and we have to have a reasonable answer for it. And you know to the level that they have taken it, and Christians are saying, well, you know, I mean, uh, I understand, you know, I believe that well, one should have a choice. And, and uh, the, the bottom line of that, as I told you before, I quit arguing that. You do have a choice. Even God says, choose you this day. He told you what to choose, but if you choose not to choose what he told you to choose, you make a choice. There are consequences for the choice. Yes, so I don't think any believer has to keep fussing and arguing about, you know, a choice. I mean, I'm pro-life. That's period. Okay? Now, somebody says, well, I'm, you know, I'm a Christian, and people do that. They, well, I'm a Christian. I love God, and you can't judge me. Now, see where you went? 
you know, I can't judge you. No, we ain't talking about all that. We're talking about the subject at hand. If the subject at hand is abortion, then you show me what the Bible says is right. And can't nobody do that. That's why they revert to all that other stuff. You ever found that you watch this life teaches you sometimes people who are guilty about stuff are the ones that defend it on feelings and emotions and not fact. And let's deal with facts. It's like somebody said, well, you know, just things. They just don't love no more. Oh, what, 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 what? What's the facts? Well, you know, it's just, I mean, I just feel. That's your problem. Mm -hmm. You just feel. Get saved and be led by the Spirit. And some things we ain't going to feel. My time is up. Thank you for yours. I appreciate you and appreciate your time. Oh, Lord, to help. Uh, we'll be right here Sunday. Now...